We had an interesting question about serotonin, right? And uh, the question is, well, isn't serotonin good for you if uh, you, know, you want to eat it in, in your vegetables and things like that? And what's that? What's up? What's good? What's good? What's good? So serotonin, uh, I, I think I can probably say it kind of takes care of itself. If you get too micromanaging your serotonin, you might be a little bit too compulsive if you look at diet part of it. So what we uh, instruct people to do uh, during a collection for 5-HIA would be to restrict or, uh, you know, serotonin, tryptophan rich foods that would artificially increase the serotonin. And it all depends on what your 5-HIA level or serotonin level. If your 5-HIA is 150 and your dietary component to it is, uh, you know, from, from bananas and tomatoes and walnuts and kiwi fruit and things, then restricting that during it might not make a big difference if you're way up there at 150. But if you're down around below 50 for sure, then the dietary component is, is important. And one of, I, I, you know, just the stories and anecdotes, uh, you can't stay away from this, but uh, I had a 70-year-old man who flushed and his 5-HIA his came back at 30. And so the first thing you do when you get them in is you repeat it, but you repeat it on a 5-HIA, on a, on a tryptophan limited diet. And, and then when you took his history, he was eating six bananas every day. And so the, the, each banana gives you about three milligrams per 5-HIA, so 6 times 3 is 18, and then you did the math, oh, it was the best carcinoid to have was one that was induced by, by uh, bananas. So just taking a dietary history can help understand what that is. Now the confusing part of this is that patients are instructed because during the collection of 5-HIA, they're, in, they're instructed to restrict those serotonin uh, rich foods, tryptophan rich foods, and they think they continue that for, for, forever. Oh, that's the way it's supposed to be forever. No. No, you can eat the nuts, the kiwi fruit, the, and, and what we say is don't uh, eat something that doesn't eat you, right? So, you know, if, if uh, eat tomatoes and tomatoes don't agree with you, yeah. you know, it's not because of the tryptophan, you know, it's just that you shouldn't be eating tomatoes. Uh, but there's a, the, the amount, the dietary contribution to the serotonin is really not that great enough to worry about tumor promotion, tumor progression, symptom symptom uh, and all that. So I think just be aware that it can affect the 24-hour urine 5-HIA. Does that help? I think that Does that help? Does that help? Yeah, and, and I think she also had a question like, doesn't serotonin make you happy and what, what's the deal? So serotonin does make you happy uh, if, it's, if, the ele if the levels are elevated inside your brain. So unfortunately the elevated levels in your blood doesn't contribute to the elevated levels in the in the brain. Otherwise, you'd have your own factory for SSRIs. You know, you, you never would have to see a psychiatrist, right? <laughs> for effects or all these drugs, you know, you've got your own in-house pharmacy, you know, production. Um, so, I guess that being said, uh, there's okay. So there's. Uh, question as it relates to uh, taking octreotide injections as it relates to post-treatment PRT. Uh, they're, they're not specific on how long and why to do it. Uh, if you took the injection, the mastatin injection for PRT is part of your treatment uh, and, and uh, slow, I guess, I think it's slow cancer growth with it. Well, why should I continue when post-PRT and is it okay to stop taking it then? Okay, so this is uh, an interesting area of therapeutics as well. Um, the, the data is not there to guide us specifically to use uh, the somastatin analogs post-PRT. Uh, the data suggests that you do better if you're on the somastatin analogs post-RT. And when we go back and look at the Netter 1 trial, we can see on the control arm that was just somastatin analogs without PRT, even when they progressed, they did their quality of life mate was higher uh, on the quality of life forms that was published uh, uh, earlier this year. 
And so we know somastatin analogs is a quality of life drug in addition to slowing tumor growth. So as it relates to PRT, some of my patients aren't on the analog going into PRT for various reasons. They're not on it. Most people don't get PRT unless there's an indication of either worsening symptoms or the tumor progressing or something a little bit in between there. So if they're not on analogs, I don't put them on afterwards because why do that? They're not on it before. <clears throat> so I think this question is one that if you're on it, PRT is really doing its job, you don't need it anymore because it's killed the cancer cells. The only problem is it doesn't kill enough to really deal with uh, the hormonal secretion. So the Netter 1 trial did not report out 5-HIA and serotonin. It wasn't part of it. So we don't know. It'll take post-approval data to tell us what happens to these biomarkers. We suspect they go down some, but how long they, slow, they go down. So we uh, are very interested in that question of how somatostatin analog should be used post-PRT. I think at this point it's going to be on an individual basis and there's not going to be a hard answer. Do you have any comments on that, Tom? Yeah, I think, I mean, you hit it right on the head, which is that, um, you know, all the studies that we have now show that the somatostatin analogs, in addition to PRT, uh, certainly augment the effect of PRT during those treatments. Now, as Dr. Anthony was mentioning, many folks who are already on somatostatin analogs, it makes intuitive sense to continue folks on it, um, because it does seem that there may be some combined continuing effects of the PRT in, in addition to the somatostatin analogs. But I think for folks who weren't on them before, um, I think that's kind of the million dollar question. So we, we don't quite know, but, but I think what we do know is that when you're delivering PRT, it works better uh, with somatostatin analogs. Okay, let's go to the next question. Um, <clears throat> how do you know if your serotonin levels are causing your symptoms? Dr. Dosh, you want to take that one on? Um, so also a great question, um, because sometimes, as, um, as you know, Dr. Anthony is mentioning, uh, symptoms can happen for a variety of reasons. Usually there is some correlation. I mean, folks who have kind of fluid carcinoid syndrome, classic diarrhea and flushing, usually the levels of the 5-HIA are, are elevated. Now, uh, in some cases, they, they may not be, and um, sometimes that really comes down to the question of what assays you're using to measure. Um, you know, we, we know that things like the 24-hour year um, are very sensitive to, to pick up serotonin levels, but it's also a pain because it's you have to collect it over 24 hours. Um, you know, I, I've actually started to move towards getting blood uh, to, to measure 5-HIA uh, levels, um, but again, I think there's still more work that needs to be done to look at the, the correlation. But in general, in my experience, I found that very few folks who, you know, have kind of fluid syndrome or syndrome symptoms don't have an, el uh, an elevation in 5-HIA, and it may not be one one to one, um, but there may be some elevation. So we did really not talk about uh, mechanisms of, of flushing uh, and other things these tumors do. So when there's serotonin, when there's a, an amine being secreted, there's also what are called neuropeptides that are being secreted. This is not a single active one hormone. So there's a product called uh, substance P that's commonly secreted, that's more implicated in the flushing component to it. So this is kind of a, 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 a gamish of products that these tumors are making, and that's why people's symptoms vary. So some people will flush and have no diarrhea. Some people have diarrhea, not a single flush. And then you'll have the flushing and the diarrhea together. And, and so it's all dependent on which mediator is active. We think serotonin has connections to the diarrhea part because of the gut part. Uh, but it's more than just serotonin. Carcinoma syndrome is a lot more than just serotonin. Uh, so when my journey is over and I want to donate my body for net specific research, how do I make that happen? Dr. Iyer. You've got a bank. Does your bank include bodies? <laughs> Such, uh, you know, that's uh, whoever sent that question. I, I applaud you. I thank you for, you know, it's not easy to face mortality and even think that far for many people. So I thank you for that question. I have been asked that question before. 
Um, yes, uh, we can. It's, it wouldn't be exactly through this bank, but we do have researchers and people trying to understand, you know, healthy tissue and the impact healthy liver, for example, has on the tumor. And that's hard to answer because when we do surgery or uh, get a biopsy, we only get the tumor, we don't get the healthy stuff, you know, because that's not needed. And I think that that is what some of these um, autopsy studies allow us to understand. Another thing that we also understand from this is other tumors in different locations different. Uh, we biopsy the one that's most readily available. We biopsy what you know we can reach, but uh, but that is something we can also understand. Our bone tumor is different, so yes, we do have a uh, autopsy program at Roswell. Not exactly the neuroendocrine bank because this one is set up for you to say yes and participate, answer questions, and so on. So you can participate in the bank now, and God forbid, down the road, uh, we can send you the forms for for all the other stuff. Dr. Das. What goes on at Vanderbilt? Yeah, so I mean, I think the the same element. Um, you know, our, our our pathology labs and, and folks, there's always um, ability to, to do so. Um, just almost like a, an organ donor uh, component. Uh, there are registries through Vanderbilt as well um, uh, that are accessible um, uh, to for folks to, to contribute to, to science. Um, you know, after after their time. So I'll, I'm going to sort of be the devil's advocate. I hate to be negative, but. Uh, medical education has transformed uh, immensely over uh, the decades and now gross anatomy no longer is as intense with the human body as it once was. So at the University of Kentucky they've got too many bodies that you know there's a greater need of, uh, uh, they use electronic, they use uh, all, all kinds of simulations uh, there's a plasticized body. There's all kinds of new th things that they teach gross anatomy with. Um, so when I talk to our chair of pathology, um, they, they just don't have a program that allows bodies to be donated anymore. It's kind of wild. I never thought I'd get to that point. Uh, it, it was just uh, when I first came to UK about eight years ago, they pointed out that we weren't getting autopsies anymore and when I took over the chief's position I had to go to the meetings and explain to everyone why we don't order autopsies anymore because they can't train pathologists if they don't have autopsies so you do autopsies now in homicidal cases and stuff like that but you know we know from the gallium scan from CT scans I mean we know why people die and so we don't really have to do autopsies to figure out what we used to do. So it, it, it's really interesting. No bodies and then nobody's doing autopsies and the whole medical thing has sort of really tra tra transformed over the last 30 years. So um, I don't want to get too gross or too weird about this, but at Hopkins uh, they have something called a warm autopsy. And uh, you, are you all familiar? Okay, Dr. Iyer. So, so what Hopkins has done is that someone that wants to donate their body to science, then they will a bit be able to take warm tissue but, uh, and study that, and that's of greater value. It's probably maybe what you were talking about. Yeah, so Dr. Iyer didn't want to go into too much detail about it, but understanding the physiology outside of, of when a body uh, is actually... Uh, uh, goes through rigor mortis and goes through all that. So warm autopsies form a potential valuable service in some specialized centers. So, okay, uh, we'll get off of that. So they, they work with yeah. the organ donation uh, people in that particular city because when people have to donate an organ, let's say eyes or whatever, the same group that would access those tissues, you know, for for organ donation, go and take the tissues that we would need for our research, and we give them instructions ahead of time when it's getting close to the end. That's how it's done. So the next question is, how often does 5 HI need to be checked, Dr. Doss? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, I think it, there's a little bit of a stylistic preference on sort of how frequent, and I think it depends really on uh, the patient and the symptoms. Because truly, if you're, for example, titrating an octreotide dosage, uh, that may be something that, you know, even you're checking monthly. Typically, I, I check every three months, um, particularly if we make a change in the dose of octreotide um, to really allow for the physiologic effects of the octreotide to, um, you know, slow the serotonin production. Um, so I, I typically do it every three months, but there are cases uh, which, you know, I, I will check more frequently. 
you have any comments? Uh, I'm, I'm going to let the person that wrote this question help me a little bit. What was response to our role in platelet regeneration? Does this relate to the hepatic regeneration of serotonin in platelets? Uh, I'm a little, yes. Oh, okay, after response to PRT. Uh, what, okay, okay. So platelet regeneration after PRT is something that we really just have to have time. I, 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 I'm right there with you now while it's confusing. Uh, splenectomy does not play a role, okay? That was a joke, okay? I, I hope you, he never had done it before. But, you know, he, Dr. Lou was right. You can increase platelets with taking the spleen out. But we would be in so much trouble doing that 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 you, you, you weren't here this morning, Dr. Iyer, but that was one of the one of the ways that we can get platelets up. We can, but there's not a growth factor that we can give to generate platelets. So we have to wait wait it out. Some people do not get their platelets back. In the being on the data safety monitoring committee, I saw where there was a group of people who basically after four doses would be living between 60 and 80,000, and that's okay. That's not people don't bleed. It's not. Like, but you just can't get more PRT. And uh, so we, we want the platelets with uh, ideally like them above 100,000, uh, but some people will never get there after PRT. Yeah, so um, in my experience and from what talking to our hematology doctors, two answers. Some people will have a delayed recovery. They just need a year, even two years sometimes to come back close to normal, may not be perfect. And then there's another group that may not recover, like Dr. Anthony said, and there seem to be, uh, this isn't just with PRRT, actually, it's with certain chemotherapies too. Some patients just have bad bone marrow, you know, responses. They need much lower doses and we don't understand why. So there have been studies done on bone marrow biopsies and now some, like all these genomic tests that we have that are under learning that there are some clones, certain mutations or things that are predisposing people to have that kind of response. And so some of these uh, sort of clonal hematopoiesis problem clinics are starting in the country in certain centers, Cleveland Clinic, certain places. So they're hoping to sort of a priori once you give, let's say, I expect to give carboid toposide for someone with high grade neuroendocrine and the counts just don't come back for me to give the second dosage. There's no disease in the bone marrow, then why did this not come back? This person's only 60 years old, and they've not had prior chemo, why? And when they do some of these studies, they're understanding that this person was predisposed. Maybe their dose needed to be different, or maybe we shouldn't have picked the carboplatin, or whatever. So I think they're trying to do those things, but we're still learning. We're, we're not there <laughs> with the final answer. Regarding lung nets, what would you recommend for post-surgery long-term follow-up? You want to take that one, Dr. Doss? So, uh, so again, you know, I think some of it depends on sort of the pathologic specimen, right, of what the lung tumor showed. Um, you know, I think Dr. Iyer had identified that KI-67 is a little bit more finicky and hasn't been used in lung neuroendocrine tumors. Actually, mitoses are, which was sort of what we talked about a little bit earlier this morning, too, which is another indicator of how active cells can be. So, typically... Um, you know, it depends also what kind of scan was done prior to the lung uh, resection. So, for example, if a gallium scan was done beforehand and this lung tumor happened to have gallium expression, um, you know, at some point it may not be unreasonable to, to get a gallium scan, but typically CT scans, um, uh, you know, for, uh, again, the, the follow-up is sort of dictated by, uh, I think, what was seen on the pathology specimen. So for a, a typical lung t neuroendocrine tumor, uh, which tends to be kind of the equivalent of the well-differentiated gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, getting a, a CT scan at maybe three months and then spacing it out thereafter um, is not unreasonable. The, the typical carcinoids do well. Their 10-year survival is 90% plus. So if the pathology was done right and, you know, everything was stained and that, that biopsy was correct, then chances of recurrence are less. So when chances of recurrence are less, then the follow-up can also be matched and be less. In terms of what scan, I completely agree, depends on what showed the disease best. Atypical carcinoids, some are better seen on FDG PET. Some are better seen on gallium, and some don't show up on either of those scans, and really only on CT. So sort of doing two, three in the first year and seeing what is giving you your best answer. Little bit, it's also dictated by insurance, let me tell you. <laughs> if you try to do too many gallium scans, they're not very happy. So, so sometimes you have to find a way to find that happy medium. 
post-op lung nets. Uh, I do not have carcinoma syndrome. How do I avoid developing the syndrome and what determines the syndrome? So in, uh, in lung um, carcinoids, the likelihood of having um, syndrome is less. It's about 10% is what the books say. Um, so in, in the absence of disease, the likelihood of having syndrome is less. But could you have some reactive airway disease? There is something called dipneck, um, a, sort of a reactive condition in the lungs that is like carcinoid, but not quite. Um, so sometimes we have to check and see if there's something else that's not exactly um, carcinoid recurrence that might be causing the person uh, symptoms, but often if you are having carcinoid syndrome, wheezing, chest tightness, etc., um, and it's not asthma, it's not something else that's more common, uh, the, the disease that's causing it should be visible. It should be visible. Just one other thing to add is, again, lung nets, although rarely functional, they can produce histamine as well, which sometimes can also cause a syndrome in its own right um, w with those symptoms. So. We call that the sort of atypical carcinoma syndrome, and it works a little bit differently where you see more uh, swelling and more histamine kind of reactions where the body can be total body. Okay, Georgia has no net specialist that we are aware of. Where would you recommend? Emory is uh, probably where you should be looking if you want to stay in state or you could go out of state, but uh, Emory does have a, a, a forming group. They're superb on imaging. They've got excellent interventional radiologists, uh, good surgeons. Uh, so. I would probably turn to Emory at this point. You, any comment there? I think there's also a, uh, a medical oncologist there who focuses on uh, neuroendocrine tumors, uh, Waleed Shaib. Um, he was actually my fellow when I was a med student there. He's fantastic, but so he's there too. So I'm waiting for him to show up at Nanats and then I'll start promoting him. So Nanats is a North American Learning Tumor Society. It meets once a year. This year it's next month in, in Boston. It's not a patient conference, but it's a conference of about 500 net specialists from all over the world. They'll get together and kick the tires and really get down into research questions and we fund young young investigators and it's really intense about two days of real intensity uh, yeah oh. yeah yeah, that's the next day. That's after the conference, though. Okay, so he, see, Bob has to get his two cents worth in here, which is critical. So while the experts are assembled, he's taking full advantage of that, but it's really outside of Nanette's. But it's brilliant. You're a genius, so I applaud you for it. Do it. That's great. Okay? I mean, you, you might as well. You might as well. Okay. Lung nets, well differentiated, grade one, grade one KI67, not mentioned in the surgical path report. Should the KI67 be routinely measured? This is always a good question. Yeah, so, you know, 1998, it's been a long time. That's where the guidance sort of document came from on how to do the scoring. And, uh, and you know, three is the cutoff in the lung, and two is the cutoff in, in, in the GI and outside the lung for KI-67 if it's done. So you can't really fault that pathologist for not doing it. He's reading that paper <laughs> and all the guidelines. But could it add some value? Yes. And I think the one place where we find it a little bit helpful is sometimes people get a fine needle biopsy, so they can't really count mitoses. You know, for mitoses, you need so many high power fields. But you can at least spin the cell block down and do the KI-67 on the block. So that's maybe a place where currently guidelines lines, evidence-based, you can use it. But I think if you really want to know, you can certainly ask. It doesn't, it doesn't take much to get the answer. Okay, very good. Uh, flushing. What is flushing and what symptoms come with it? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So flushing, what we think of flushing is just like serotonin can affect different components of the body in terms of organs, um, they can also uh, actually affect blood vessels and the nerves that travel with blood vessels. So we think of flushing as what we call a vasomotor type of response. And so it's actually the effect of serotonin and the receptors on, on blood vessels, which basically causes, um, you know, sort of sequential dilation and a lack of dilation. So it's, it's literally exactly like sort of the word, which is, it's almost, folks describe it as almost like a, um, a heat wave, oftentimes starting from the head that, that goes down. Um, the face and, and torso or chest are the most commonly involved, but folks can flush um, in a variety of different distributions. So it's different from a flash, right? Hot flashes, different from a flash. 
So I, I think where it gets very interesting here is that males as they age really don't have hot flushing, don't have flushing. So it's taken a little differently. Females as they age, flushing is physiologic. So there it gets really confusing. So, so it's up to, I'm going to say the healthcare system to help the, the individual distinguish what's physiologic versus what's patho pathologic. So physiologic vasomotor symptoms, particularly whole body, whole body, and it can be wet. With carcinoid, hot, uh, with a uh, flush from carcinoid, it's upper body and it's dry. So some people, if you're going through menopause, have both. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I think one young lady here wish she was flushing again because she stays cold all the time, so she wants to flush again. So, uh, so, so the other th way we do it is is what provokes it. With carcinoid flushing, the five E's provoke it. So it would be emotions, whether it's happy or sad, exercise, ethanol, uh, epinephrine, and there's one more in there. So, uh, well, eating. So eating sometimes is hot foods might do it. Certain cheeses or something. Uh, so, so you kind of have to kind of. And then with physiologic flushing, then those uh, things may respond to suppression with estrogen replacement. Doesn't mean you need to be on it, but you know we don't expect a carcinoid flush to respond to estrogen, to hormonal. Okay, get off of that. You got anything? Yeah. yeah. So we were both talking about this flushing thing. Um, I'm trying to, before I was diagnosed, I had these weird symptoms that I would consider flushing because I wasn't sure exactly what this flushing felt like, but I would get hot all over my body sometimes for hours. But then I would get tachycardia and the diarrhea would start. And I mean, is tachycardia involved with that at times as well? Is that a symptom? Interesting. Yeah. Because yeah. you know, we saw this morning tachycardia. I mean, this afternoon, serotonin can drive that that it atrial it rate. Really Absolutely. Like I was either yeah. being plugged into something or I was being unplugged. So what she brings up is the difficulty in diagnosing the syndrome. Very vague, confusing. So, yeah, and, and then the redness, if it's total body, that's vasomotor throughout the body. If it's focused more face, upper body, maybe the hands and the feet, that's more carcinoid. And then if you are wheeling up, it's more bronchial. Particularly if you have facial swelling, the lasting for hours sounds like bronchial. Or, or, or not. So it's not it, was, it was what? I have sarcoidosis. You see? So you're throwing a lot of different things at the medical system. So you can see complications. So I've had the sarcoid carcinoid patient, and it gets real confusing. Uh, okay, so that's probably enough about that topic. Uh, okay, uh, for Dr. Iyer, how old can your tumor sample be? In, no, no. How, I guess how old, uh, like can the sample be a year ago? Can you have had it a year ago? Yeah. Any 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 age. any age. Yeah. There's yeah. no age on it at all. Yeah. If the sample is let's say 20, 30 years ago, odds are the lab doesn't have it anymore. But doesn't matter how old it is, um, as long as the the lab would release it and send it to us. Um, but uh, when we look at the sample, let's just say for whatever reason, how they kept it or preserved it or something, there's been deterioration in the quality of the DNA or whatever. Then we just won't be able to use it. But uh, but most of the work that currently assays that have been developed are good enough to account for that you know they'll, they'll use more cells to get enough DNA of good quality to get the answer okay my tumor was found in my ovary how often is this the primary and only tumor still very new to this so I mean uh, quite it's quite rare that uh, you know just a, a, a de novo ovarian neuroendocrine tumor is there typically we see um, actually uh, colon or sort of more hindgut neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, the the ovary can actually be what we call kind of a almost a sanctuary site. Um, there's some almost like a, a drop metastasis, meaning one sort of neuroendocrine cell could have broken off, and instead of lodging in the peritoneum, it kind of binds in the, the ovary. Um, but as far as I know, kind of a de novo neuroendocrine tumor in the ovary is quite rare. Yeah, especially. 
Yeah, so th this is where you really would benefit going to net specialist because um, it has to be thought of. Why, if it's in the ovary, we would be thinking it's somewhere else. And maybe it went to the ovary and started the ovary. So there's plenty of literature supporting primary ovarian carcinoids, but we know that drop mets to the pelvis is common. I'm, I'm thinking it's about one out of four or five, 20, 25 percent. We see it a lot. Okay, if you are trying to find a neuroendocrine specialist for consultation, how do you find one that is best for you? It's a great question. Bob! <laughs> Well, first off, where do you live? I mean, if there is one close, it's okay to fly to Denver, but if you happen to live in Kentucky, you might want to consider Dr. Anthony. Uh, number two, have you been to one? And number three, you really have to make that choice based on some kind of a background or knowledge. So coming to these things, I'm sure you're sitting there and have formed some opinions about what specialist you'd go to. And it is an individual thing. You can't go to a doctor that you don't have confidence in. So pick one that you feel confident. How do you keep up with we, we don't have a list on our website because we do feel it's an it's a, it's a individual thing. So to put a list that like you'll see, and they are out there, uh, you can find lists of specialists. Uh, we, get, we get emails two or three times a week saying, yeah, some specialist. He wasn't even there to see me. So, but that's not us. That's why we don't do it because we want you to be able to have a a better idea of who who these folks are. No simple answer. You should do some research, and you know that might include speaking with us, coming to conferences, those kind of things. Checking out what uh, what's available, who's available reason, uh, regionally, and uh, and then you know trying, trying. Yeah. It, uh, the first one might, may not be the one for you. So, dot org, yeah, carcinoid dot org. Yeah, I was just gonna say. Yeah, I do have it. a list. Um, they that's have a system it. where carcinoid.org, just adding to what you just said, um, have a way of um, asking. So you can't really just get listed there. Somebody who's already recognized as an expert and your CV listing that you've published and you're really actually contributing to the field. So they have like a vetting system. And if if you meet those criteria and get two letters of recommendation from you know known experts, then you get listed on that website. So that's one one place you can look but if I were you I would always just you know like he said feel confident you know even though um, you know you're not a Toyota dealer but if you have to buy one you know online you can do some research and when you're in there when you talk to the person you know if this is the right thing for you we all can learn when it comes time uh, you know for us and I think one question always to ask is do you have a multidisciplinary conference do you have a multidisciplinary team are you routinely talking to the surgeon the medical oncologist the gastroenterologist is everyone there and once you know that they are routinely talking talking and they're all in the same building. We bump into each other in elevators all the time and we talk about, you know, patients. So I think just knowing that they're all there should maybe give you confidence. When should you have repeat dotate scan after the first one? So that's a um, tough question because there's so many answers to it. So I'll answer it in three answers. Uh, everyone should have one at baseline. I think we have pretty much all agreed that, that the, the doctor scans are not as helpful, they're not as sensitive. So if you're newly diagnosed, then you should have one. But let's just say that the disease that was found was limited and it was able to be resected. There's no really strong evidence that doing a gallium to detect recurrence is the way to go. Uh, there was a study in Germany two, three years ago that said yes, in a patient that had di disease, had surgery, the gallium would find the disease or find something abnormal soon than a CAT scan, but it doesn't mean that we're going to act on it. Just because we found a two millimeter thing, it doesn't mean that we're going to go and operate on it. You know, many times what the gallium finds, there's no matching CAT scan sort of lesion. So in that situation where you've had a baseline, all the disease is resected, 
how much extra that gallium will add from continuously, you know, sort of doing it, maybe periodically, yes. So that would be one group. There's another group of patients for whom the gallium is a definite go-to because either they're, they have CAT scan dye allergy, um, even an MRI doesn't detect the disease or the MRI only detects the liver disease but the bony disease is not getting picked up, you know. So really in, in patients where more than half the disease is picked up by the gallium and a lot of it is not picked up on other scans and there's a contraindication, then for those people the galliums really make a lot of sense and you can sell that to insurance and get them to pay for it. And then there's the patient who's considering surgery or some change in treatment plans, you know. Somebody has disease progression in the liver, but you want to know, before I do a liver-directed therapy, is there more progression somewhere else? They're losing so much weight, it can't just be from these two new liver lesions. So there the gallium's really helpful, because rather than go for a liver-directed plan, now you may choose PRRT. So I think when a big treatment decision has to be made, you know, um, that could be another place. I think those are the three places where the answer is a little bit more, in my mind, clear cut. But for the majority of patients, doing it every two to three years or once a year, perhaps at the max, is what I do. Yeah, and I think just one addition to that is sort of in the PRT period. So you know, you, you get a gallium dotatate scan prior to starting PRT. You know, when should you get one? I typically after um, I typically don't image folks in the middle. I usually get a gallium dotatate scan uh, about a month after PRT is complete uh, to kind of truly compare apples to apples. Um, you know, but one caveat, um, and I think I've told several of you guys today, this is that you know the post. PRT gallon dotatate scan can take time to evolve changes. So even, for example, a month after, let's say that something hasn't shrank or um, it, it can evolve over time and change to shrink. So just remember that caveat that even sometimes the first dotatate scan after PRT may not always immediately reflect the treatment and its ongoing effect. For someone who has never had gallium 68 with unknown small bowel primary, is there a certain amount of time a person must wait after chemolibization of the liver before a gallium 68 can be done? So I, I'm not sure if the question is to see so what happened to the response or to find the primary. So I, I possibly, I guess there are connecting it, thinking that the embolization could cause some healing, some false positive. I think they maybe address it from inflammation, healing, versus, you know, is there a lymphadenitis or is there, you know, could there be some sequelae of a chemoembolization that could cause a false positive scan or not? Like I have not done generally gallium scans that quickly. I tend to wait three months. And, um, you know, usually, like we were saying earlier, using whatever you used at baseline to help determine uh, size is best. And generally, for post chemoembolization, CT scans are best. We have something called modified resist criteria, which means they tell you what is the size, and they also set, tell you what is the viable tumor size. Because if you do just size, you get two by two. But if you do how much of it is dead, half of it may be dead. Now it's two by one. So, so so half of it died. And so that sometimes gives you more than a gallium, you know, in terms of uptake. So I would say about two or three months, get over the side effects of the, of the embolization and feel better. And then somewhere in that two to three month period would be a reasonable time to uh, get scanned if, if they felt that it was going to help decision making. Um, Okay, uh, I think we had this question earlier, do grade differentiation change with disease progression? And I think we touched a little bit that the grade, it could have been complex grading from the very beginning, but let's say for instance that um, the, there's indolent disease for three to five years where you got it right from the biopsy, and then after that, is it possible for the, the disease to de-differentiate um, when the tumor starts to grow, is it does it need? And I guess the real question here: Do you need to rebiopsy it uh, at the time of progression? So both answers, you know, sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't would be the answer. Um, so if there's like a more global, let's say somebody has a low grade or an intermediate grade tumor and things have been progressing at whatever three millimeters per scan rate, and now 
the last two scans, things, new things have popped up in sort of a global change everywhere. Things are changing and growing. Um, odds are, even if you biopsy that, and it was a KI-67 of 4%, it'll probably still be 4 or 5%. So they still show the same KI-67, but they're acting a little bit faster growing. And whether that has to do with the total tumor burden, now the immune system can't hold it down, or the tumor has some other features that we don't appreciate or understand, or there's some flaw in how we stain, I don't know. So that's one group when there's global disease progression that we tend not to biopsy because more often than not, we're gonna get, get the same answer that we did before. But then there are patients that have like one thing growing. There's 10 spots, all those are fine, but there's one new spot or one spot that's growing at a much faster rate. And for those, if you biopsy, often those have de-differentiated. Those have become high grade. And the approach I have taken, and I know many of my colleagues have taken is, for that one, we would do radiation or, or treat it like we would treat high grade, but continue the sando or whatever else for the remainder of the disease. So I, I don't know if that. Okay, uh, the next one is, what are the precautions used to prevent side effects of PRT, such as anemia from bone marrow disorder or leukemia? I think, again, a great question. Um, right now, you know, we truly don't have uh, a ton of precautions. I mean, I think the precautions that we're taking are sort of thinking about sequencing, and I think there's a movement in the field, and um, this will probably be validated by some of that uh, NEDR1 data, that smaller lesions respond better to PRT, and perhaps a role for earlier incorporation of PRT before folks get lots of other um, agents, uh, such as alkylating agents, which can suppress the bone marrow. Um, but I think beyond that, um, and, and sort of beyond the, the doses that uh, that we give, I mean, sometimes um, I think a priori, without giving a dose, we don't usually sort of modify, uh, you know, to sort of protect the bone marrow. So it, it's still a little bit of an experiment um, as to you know how we protect the the bone marrow uh, at this point. Just to add to that, you know, as we were saying earlier when you had asked about those clonal certain mutations or things that some people have in their bone marrow that are going to predispose them, that work is going on. So it's possible some years from now that we do some of that ahead of time and then modify the dose or say, okay, this individual will only get two doses of PRRT or get one millicurie instead of two, you know, matching it to what that person's bone marrow is likely to do once those studies are done, maybe in the future, but for the time being, we're monitoring your labs, you know, before each dose. And if someone's taking too long to recover after two doses, for example, and they've gotten the clinical benefit, we choose not to give them more if they don't m match those lab criteria. Okay, let me just uh, sort of the closing comments. You all have been a phenomenal audience. I'm not just saying that, but I've done this quite a few times, and this audience has been very interactive, and it's uh, so rewarding to. to impart information to people that want it. So as a bonus, we've got like a couple of minutes left. I'm going to let one question come from the audience. And, and this question is going to have to be a burning question that did not get answered with this expert panel that we've had all day. Is there one question that if somebody leaves here, they'll say, you know, I, I spent all this time and effort and I, and I had my question and it didn't get it. Okay, right here it is. Okay, here. Okay, now. You got to talk to Mike with um, the research, do you think with more of um, Steve Jobs, Aretha Franklin, uh, this cancer will have more awareness, more dedication for research? It seems like it's very, like when, when, you, when you tell people like what this is, really no one has heard of it. Mm -hmm. And then when you, when you, Dave Thomas, yes, Dave Thomas, founder of Wendy's, yeah. And then everyone's like, oh yeah, I remember Steve Jobs and um, how he was trying, he was trying to do more of a holistic um, ways. There's, there's absolutely no question that when a celebrity, something happens to celebrity, it draws attention to that disease. I think Aretha Franklin would be the most recent one. Um, uh, unfortunately, and maybe you're maybe a little closer to Detroit, uh, I knew the, as soon as I knew where her care was delivered, I knew who took care of her, so I started texting, emailing the person. I think he probably, you know, he played it really cool, uh, as I expect he would. Uh, no, I don't think Aretha's, uh, the, the whole sensation of it, but I'm not sure that her intent was to promote awareness. It was certainly not Steve Jobs' intent. 
that he did not have any intent to promote it. But, but, and then Dave Tom, yeah. So awareness comes sort of indirectly, where we sort of promote it, we talk about it. Uh, but those three figures, Dave Thomas's uh, fortune went to orphans. Uh, Steve Jobs went nowhere. He didn't want his name associated with a medical diagnosis. Stanford approached, approached him to name a wing after him. Uh, even after he died, there's been still courting of the estate with, from Stanford attempting to see if that would change. But I think Steve Jobs' will is pretty hardcore. It's not going to help. Uh, and then, uh, so unfortunately, these celebrities did not embrace the difficulty that people with this disease faces. And I think Aretha's, I, I know very little about Aretha's. Do you, does anybody here know much more? Uh, we know a lot about Steve Jobs because he wrote a book about it. So I can give you his whole history. Uh, and I yeah. talked to critical people that were part of his care. Uh, you have any comments on that, Dr. Don? I, I was just going to say, you know, I think um, regardless of whether sort of that advocacy component was done, I think definitely folks having that diagnosis certainly increased the national awareness about this diagnosis. And, um, you know, from some of the trials that Dr. Anthony showed, uh, the rate of progress and the, the number of new drugs and therapeutics that have come up in neuroendocrine tumors in the last five years, uh, I, I mean, I think it reflects the fact that the research fund the efforts, and I think a lot of investigators are now looking into this disease. So I think even if it wasn't directly, I think indirectly there's certainly been um, more research efforts and progress that's been made um, by virtue of some of these diagnoses. Who is this now? Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Oh, no, she has pancreatic cancer. She has pancreatic cancer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no question about it. She's incredible. Yeah, yeah, she had a flip-flop. Yeah, she had lung nerve. Yeah, she said she had lung nerve. Yeah, so that's an involved in the brain. Yeah, she had lung nerve. 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 Yeah, she had lung just about the awareness question, I think that um, as drugs get approved um, and you do well and you live longer, then the need arises to then do something next. You know, when there's nothing, you're working in a dark black box. But as people do well, you need the next thing and then the next thing and that's what drives, you know, it's like when you have a child, after he or she's done with school, they want to go to college, they're bright, they want to learn, then they want to get a PhD and then they want to learn more. And so I think that's your survival, your success, your participation in studies is what's going to drive us all feeling the need. As doctors, we don't like to say no, we don't like to give up, we don't like to say I have nothing more for you. And so we're as committed to finding something to go to that next and next and next and take what we already have and refine it and do better with it. So that's going to be one of the big drivers of you know progress in the field. But also you should know that the Department of Defense, the DOD, periodically looks, that's the NIH is one place and the DOD is the other place. And so a lot of their requests for grant funding for the DOD this past year for the first time, they included adrenal tumors and rare tumors so that you can apply. In the past, it was all prostate, breast, you know, common things, lung. And uh, five years ago, they included liver when they realized that liver cancer is on the increase. And, and then this year, for the first time, they included rare nets and adrenal tumors. So, so yes, there is more attention coming and awareness coming that there is an unmet need. Yes, it's uh, uh, having famous people have the disease, that's something to talk about, uh, but it really does still lie in our hands to, to uh, create and continue to push the awareness. Uh, and we can't get around that. We've, I've been doing this for 15 years. People have other agendas and, uh, you know, Steve Jobs, whatever his thoughts were, it doesn't really matter. We can talk about it, so that's good, because we could say, oh, this one had it or that one had it, but it's up to us to drive the awareness. And uh, I think that that's a key message. And again, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, because everybody is here uh, wanting to uh, increase their own knowledge and the awareness of this disease. So uh, with that, I'd like to wrap up. It's been a long day, and I hope that, uh, that everybody got a lot out of this, uh, this conference. I wanted to thank our sponsors, Novartis, Ipsin, Lexicon, Curum, 
uh, th th those were our sponsors. We had two other uh, people displaying things there. Enter Aid and AAA, Advanced Appli uh, Accelerator Applications. Uh, I'd like to thank our speakers, Dr. Anthony, who, well, he, it, it's nice to have Dr. Anthony here because he doesn't complain. And all I did was say, could you do a presentation? Uh, how, how about two? Uh, and maybe uh, kind of lead the panel or maybe twice. And he said, yep. So he, you know, please give a, a big round of applause to Dr. Anthony. Okay. Dr. Iyer and uh, Leanne Burns and to Dr. Das and of course to Eric Liu who's leaving on a jet plane, but we are, we're really, really appreciative that you took your time out on a Saturday to come and talk to everybody. So how about a big round of applause? Well, you've done so much. Well, thank thank you very much. We we're here to help, and uh, we're we're very appreciative because I could be standing here in front of like an empty room. So I'm glad that you all showed up. You guys are the real heroes. You're out there being advocates, and uh, you know you can you you have my phone number and my email. And if you don't, then it's available everywhere. There's some cards around. Uh, let's continue the conversation and let's let's build this thing. Let's make it so people can't ignore neuroendocrine cancer, and that's going to come from our efforts. So, whatever you can do, if it's 15 minutes, if it's 15 hours, if it's 15 days, put that time in on, uh, just as part of what you do. And uh, oh, wait a second, I have I have something in the back. I will. I will tell Marianne, and she'll be very happy. She's very sad that she missed this, uh, and uh, and she missed a good one. So we're going to stay around till probably until six o'clock. I think there's some cookies and uh, pretzels and soda outside. So we're going to network for a while. So uh, we're officially dismissed, but we'll hang out.